Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Carrie Racian. I'm an associate professor of public policy here at UConn. Today's panel, Gun Violence in America, What Works and What's Possible, is hosted by INCHIP's Gun Violence Prevention Research Interest Group. I, along with Mary Bernstein in sociology and Jennifer Deneen in public policy, co-direct the GVP RIG, and we are delighted that you have joined us here today. I'd like to take a moment to thank our co-sponsors. In addition to support by INCHIP, support by the Yukon School of Law, the Departments of Public Policy and Sociology, the Collaboratory on Child and School Health, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Yukon Hartford, and the Connecticut chapter of the Scholars Strategy Network have all worked to make today's panel possible. I'd also like to direct your attention to the resource tab, which is located in the left part of your screen. There you will find today's program, speaker bios, and several resources related to gun violence prevention. We hope you find those useful. The GVP RIG seeks solutions to reduce all forms of gun violence and to better understand those solutions. Gun violence in America is an urgent public health crisis, now more than ever. But also now more than ever, there is an opening for public conversation and potential policy change. Solutions to gun violence will require our collective expertise. UConn's GVP rig believes conversations like the one we are having today can advance our goal of saving lives. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you UConn's 16th president, Tom Katsileas. President Katsileas has made clear that he and UConn stand with victims of violence. And we appreciate him being here today to provide opening remarks for this panel but more importantly, for supporting and fostering research, scholarship, and connectivity that allows us to work towards a safer future. Please join me in welcoming President Casaleas. Thank, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Professor Ressian, for that nice introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And a special thanks to, you, to the organizers of this event. It's an honor for UConn to host such a distinguished group of panelists, including Connecticut's two US senators. The fact that Senator Blumenthal and Senator Murphy are here today, along with our panelists, shows the importance of this topic, not only to the state of Connecticut, but to the entire country. It goes without saying, the terrible tragedies in Atlanta and Colorado have once again brought gun violence to the forefront of the national consciousness. This is a critical topic for people of goodwill, regardless of political perspective. That's why today's discussion is so vital. As a public research university, UConn's interest is not partisan politics, but public service. One way we serve the public is by bringing together scholars, policymakers, and practitioners in responding to major challenges. And no challenge is more urgent than building a society where all Americans can feel safe. That goal will remain out of reach in the absence of conversations like the one we will have today. By bringing together the best research in the field, the experience of community leaders, the perspective of public servants, we can start to build the infrastructure for, for public policy that benefits all Americans. Fostering the opportunities for these challenges to be addressed is at the very heart of a public university's mission. I am proud that UConn is involved in this conversation and I'm looking forward to learning from the insights of our panelists. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here for this discussion. And now I'm pleased to have Mr. Alan Bennett serve as moderator for today's discussion. Alan is a proud UConn alumnus and currently serves as a member of the board of the UConn Foundation. Alan began a distinguished legal career as associate chief counsel at the Food and Drug Administration, then was counsel to the US Senate Governmental Re Affairs Committee, which was chaired at the time by Abe Ribicoff, who was a Senator from Connecticut and a predecessor of our two guests today. After leaving the Hill, Alan founded a 22 lawyer firm, which eventually merged into Ropes and Gray, a global law firm. Alan retired from active practice in 2017, and in recent years, he's been an adjunct professor of food and drug law at the Yukon School of Law. Alan has been involved in gun violence prevention since his time as a Senate staffer, and is currently on the board of Brady United. At this time, I invite Alan and our panel members to join me by turning on their cameras and microphones. Alan, I'll hand the program over to you to introduce, introduce our distinguished panel me members. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Tom, for that uh, introduction. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to help moderate this event uh, today and this important dialogue. 
we've brought together a really impressive group of panelists who are really experts and leaders in their respective fields. And they'll share their insight on the interplay of national and state gun laws. And what I'd like to do right now is just take a few minutes and introduce all of the panelists up front at the beginning of the uh, beginning of the session. Our first panelist is Senator Richard Blumenthal. He's the senior U.S. Senator from Connecticut, currently serving his second term. Before he joined the Senate, Senator Blumenthal served in the Connecticut House of Representatives, the Connecticut State Senate, and as Connecticut's Attorney General. His efforts to strengthen gun violence prevention include work with the Judiciary Committee in the Senate on the assault weapons ban in 2013. He's tirelessly advocated for gun violence prevention, including bipartisan bills such as the 2018 Federal Extreme Risk Protection Order Act. He's introduced Ethan's Law to strengthen safe storage of guns and uh, two bills pertaining to domestic violence and guns, the Lori Jackson Domestic Violence Survivor Protection Act and the Domestic Violence Gun Homicide Prevention Act. He's also the lead author of a bill to ban ghost guns, the Untraceable Firearms Act. Background checks and extreme risk protection orders are priorities for Senator Blumenthal. We're also fortunate to have here today uh, Connecticut's junior senator, U.S. Senator, Senator Chris Murphy. Prior to being elected to the Senate, Senator Murphy served in the U.S. House of Representatives and the Connecticut General Assembly. Since the tragic shooting at Sandy Hook in Newtown in 2012, Senator Murphy has been one of the, senators of the Senate's leading proponents of reforms to reduce gun violence. In 2016, following the shooting at the Orlando nightclub, Senator Murphy's 15-hour marathon speech on the Senate floor brought attention to this issue. He has championed bipartisan bills aimed at keeping guns out of the hands of criminals. In Congress, Senator Murphy led 45 of his colleagues in reintroducing the Background Check Expansion Act, S-529, to expand the federal Brady background check system to all gun sales. Senator Murphy also has led a bipartisan effort to reform our mental health system. Our third speaker is Dr. Cassandra Crefasi, and she's an assistant professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at Johns Hopkins University. At Johns Hopkins, she is deputy director of the Center for Gun Policy and Research and a core faculty member in the Center for Injury Research and Policy. Dr. Crefasi's research focuses on public safety, including injury epidemiology and prevention, gun violence and policy, attitudes and behaviors of gun owners, policy evaluation, and underground gun markets. And our final speaker is Ms. Jacqueline Santiago, and she's CEO at Compass Youth Collaborative Inc. in Hartford. She's an advocate for equal opportunities for youth, a youth development trainer, and a voice for youth at risk. Ms. Santiago has been invaluable in developing measures, structures, and systems that guide Compass's work with juvenile justice involving youth. Each panelist will, make a will have five minutes for their remarks, and we will follow up the remarks with a question and answer session involving pre-selected audience participants. Having said that, I'd like to turn this over and begin our session with Senator Blumenthal. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to Alan Bennett. Thank you to the organizers for bringing us Together today, uh, this topic has preoccupied both Senator Murphy and myself for years, literally. Uh, we joined together as a team and we've been working in partnership since the tragic Sandy Hook shooting. Actually, when I was first elected as Attorney General in the 1990s, early 1990s, I championed an assault weapon ban in our state legislature. It was passed, then it was challenged. And I litigated in the courts all the way the state Supreme Court when we prevailed against many of the same arguments that are made today against common sense gun violence measures. And so we're frequently asked, what is different? Why do you think you will be able to achieve something when in the wake of Sandy Hook and indeed year after year, 
the gun lobby has been successful in defeating our efforts to enact at a federal level many of the same laws that we have here in Connecticut, strong, common sense, gun violence measures that are designed to protect Connecticut, but obviously we are at the mercy of states with the weakest laws, even though we have some of the strongest because guns have no respect for state borders. What's changed really is number one, the political dynamic. We now have a House of Representatives that is committed to stopping gun violence. It's passed two measures. One of them is a background check bill that Senator Murphy and I have championed together and the Charleston loophole closure. Uh, we have combined our efforts on those bills and we believe that we stand a chance in this Congress in the Senate because we have a Democratic majority by virtue of the vice president. And of course, we have a president who is committed to stopping gun violence. So that political dynamic is very different than in past years. Also, a majority leader, Senator Schumer, who has said there will be a vote, which we have been unable to get in the Republican controlled Senate. And then what has changed fundamentally also is that the gun lobby has lost its vice-like grip on Congress. The NRA is imploding, as you know, it's declared bankruptcy financially, but it's also morally bankrupt. And maybe most important, there is now a strong political movement. Groups like Brady, where Mr. Bennett has been very active, Brady, Gifford, Every Town. Uh, Moms Against Gun Violence, Students Against Gun Violence, Sandy Hook Promise, Newtown National Alliance, uh, Giffords, those are just some of the organizations. And in the wake of the latest tragic shootings, one of them, in fact, clearly a hate crime, we think that the political dynamic has changed. And it's more than just background checks, as Mr. Bennett noted in the introduction, We've also advocated safe storage, an Ethan Law at the federal level, named after Ethan Song, young man, uh, Guilford, Connecticut, who perished as a result of a shooting caused by an unsafely stored weapon in a neighbor's home. The Lori Jackson Domestic Violence Survivor Protection Act, named after a young woman in Oxford, Connecticut, the mother of two infant children killed by her estranged husband in her own parents' home because there was no protective order that separated her estranged husband from his guns and making sure that protective orders are effective and we close that loophole is very important. And of course, uh, ghost guns, no serial numbers, assembled, from parts in people's homes. Again, a uh, loophole and gap that we need to close. And while we're talking about gaps in the law, the sweetheart deal that gives gun manufacturers nearly complete li liability protection, a shield from any legal responsibility that is virtually unprecedented among manufacturers. PLACA, Protection Against Lawful Commerce Act. That's another repeal that we need to do. So a comprehensive approach like Connecticut has is one that ultimately is our goal. Public policy requires it. There's a political dynamic in play here that we think will be powerful. I'm on the Judiciary Committee as well as the Armed Services Committee, the Veterans Affairs Committee, the Commerce Committee, they all have a role in gun violence. In fact, gun violence affects everyone. But the Judiciary Committee, where I sit, has jurisdiction. And the subcommittee that I had as chair, Subcommittee on the Constitution, will be having hearings on gun violence laws in the months to come. At the same time, Senator Murphy and I are going to be working to try to get enough votes on both sides of the aisle 
because we do need 60 for this kind of measure under the current rules so that we can make some progress. Finally, let me just say there's always a possibility and we hope it will be a real one that Senator Bi that President Biden will move ahead with executive orders, which could help mitigate some of these gaps, whether on ghost guns, the Charleston loophole, which enables someone who is ineligible, even though they couldn't legally buy a gun to actually purchase one if the background check isn't complete within 72 hours. That's the Charleston loophole, along with background checks are the goals right now. And uh, I just really want to thank uh, everyone on this call, everyone who is participating and the panel, uh, but most especially UConn and the organizing groups and individuals for bringing us together today. Well, thank you uh, for your remarks, Senator Blumenthal. And now I'd like to turn it over to Senator Murphy for his remarks. Well, uh, thanks to everybody on the panel. I'm eager to get to it. I'll, I'll keep my remarks relatively brief. You're, um, you're framing the conversation today around two questions, what works and what's possible. Um, let's concede at the outset that um, those are two different things um, at, at the present moment. I think Dick's right. We have a unique opportunity to pass um, an anti-gun violence bill through the Senate this year, and we can talk about how to get that done. Uh, I've been on the phone with my Republican colleagues uh, all week uh, trying to work on a compromise, um, but it will be a compromise. Um, it, it will not be uh, a full encapsulation of the uh, anti-gun violence measures that we know work. Um, obviously, states are laboratories of experimentation, and, and so, you know, we look at a state like Connecticut who adopted a permit to carry law and saw a pretty immediate 40% reduction in gun homicides. You look at Missouri, who repealed their permitting law, which included a repeal of universal background checks, uh, and they saw a um, immediate 28% jump in gun homicides. Um, we have pretty good experience as to what works. Uh, what is possible right now is something different. But what is possible today is different than what was possible five or 10 years ago because of all the factors that Dick talked about. Um, but in order to understand what works, we really have to you know, sort of uh, understand you know, what's driving violence in America. It is the proliferation of guns. It's not a coincidence that last year we saw a 40% increase in gun purchases all across the country. Remember, you know, somewhere between two and three out of every 10 guns are sold without background checks. So that's just a 400% increase in guns sold through the background check system. That means that there was probably a commensurate increase in guns transferred outside the background check system, uh, which, uh, again, not coincidental to then a 25% increase in homicides uh, last year. The more guns uh, exist in a community or a state, um, the more likely you are going to have gun crime. Um, but a couple of years ago, I wrote a book uh, entitled The Violence Inside Us, and that book is was a more comprehensive look at why America has become this outlier of violence globally. Uh, and um, what's interesting to me is that there is this moment in time where American violence rates sort of spiral, um, and we all of a sudden depart from the historical sort of norm from European rates and we become this outlier. It's around the sort of um, 1830s, 1840s where this happens. Um, and since then, America has never come back down to earth. We've continued to be a much more violent nation than other high income nations. A big part of the reason for that was the invention of the handgun right around that time. It all of a sudden became easy for people to hide a lethal weapon in their pocket and you know, arguments that would normally result in pushing and shoving on the streets of New York became a gunfight. Um, but there are other things that happened at that moment. Uh, the expansion of the slave population after the invention of the cotton gin, uh, the flooding into the country of uh, immigrants fighting for economic space in an expanding America. Um, and you have to understand that as well because uh, the reason for epidemic levels of violence in this country is connected to the number of guns we have and the number of people who shouldn't have guns who have guns, but it's also connected to rates of poverty. Violence tracks poverty very closely in this country. All kinds of violence tracks poverty, suicides, domestic violence, homicides. 
Um, but it's also connected to America's history of violence as a means uh, by one race to keep another race subjugated and oppressed. Um, and if you don't do anything about that part of American history, then whatever you do on the regulation of guns will only get you a partial uh, a partial return. Uh, so what's possible um, is not the same thing as what works, but what is possible today is much greater than what was possible years ago. The need here is to have a much more comprehensive conversation about American violence beyond just the gun. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to have it and look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Senator Murphy. Uh, we're now going to turn to Dr. Cassand Cassandra Crefasi from Johns Hopkins University for her remarks. Thank you. I'm just going to uh, pull up my slides. So oh, great. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, there are a lot of policies that uh, we could discuss, and I hope that we'll have some time uh, in our discussion to talk about those. But I'm going to focus my opening remarks on three evidence-based policies. In addition to conducting evaluations of uh, what works to reduce violence, since January 2013, our center has been conducting biannual public opinion polling on specific and concrete policy solutions. We use a nationally representative sample of U.S. adults, including an oversample of gun owners and racial and ethnic minorities, so we can look at differences across groups. The first policy I want to focus on has been mentioned, and that's extending background check requirements to all gun sales to ensure that a purchaser is not legally prohibited. These laws provide a necessary foundation for all of our other gun laws to work. We've established criteria for gun ownership, but if we allow individuals to buy guns from private sellers without a background check, then we've potentially negated all the other laws we've put in place. The best estimates, also mentioned by Senator Murphy, suggest that around 20% of transfers occur through private sales. So it's important that all purchasers undergo a background check. Research on the effectiveness of comprehensive background check laws find that they are associated with fewer guns being diverted for use in crime. 85% of US adults support requiring background checks for all gun sales, regardless of the seller, to ensure that a purchaser is not prohibited. When you compare gun owners to non-gun owners, Democrats to Republicans, and Black and white respondents in our survey, more than 80% of individuals support requiring background checks for all gun sales. The comprehensive background check requirements are most effective when they are conducted as part of a purchaser licensing system, like the one in Connecticut, sometimes referred to as permit to purchase. Purchaser licensing laws address important weaknesses in federal law that create opportunities for prohibited individuals to obtain firearms. These laws require prospective purchasers to apply to law enforcement for a permit, which involves a more thorough background check that is often facilitated by fingerprinting. And there's more time to ensure that that background check can be completed. These laws occur throughout purchasing and can delay impulsive acquisition of firearms. States with purchaser licensing have significant reductions in the diversions of guns for use in crime, homicide, and suicide. Some of our current work is also finding lower rates of police-involved shootings. Overall, 72% of U.S. adults support requiring prospective gun purchasers to get a license. This includes 60% of gun owners and Republicans. Interestingly, uh, when you look at support for purchaser licensing among gun owners who live in states that already have these laws, supports at 75%. So the last policy that I'll mention now are extreme risk protection orders or ERPOs. 
These laws temporarily separate someone from their firearms during a time of crisis. Importantly, someone subject to an ERPO cannot acquire new firearms for the duration of the order. And these laws are associated with reductions in suicide, and they may also be uh, effective at preventing mass shootings. There are two ways ERPOs can be initiated, by law enforcement, which has 70% support overall, or by family, which has 76% support. Again, there are some differences by subgroups for both law enforcement and family-initiated ERPO, but there is still greater than 60% support for these policies. Uh, if you're interested in staying connected, please check out our center and thank you so much uh, for the time and I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Krafasi. Uh, for our final panelist presentation, we'll now hear from Jacqueline Santiago from the Compass Youth Collaborative. Jacqueline. Thank you, Alan. My name is Jackie Santiago, and I am the CEO at Compass Youth Collaborative, and it's an honor to be here today with all of these esteemed panelists and guests. Uh, gun laws and violence directly influence our work at Compass. Uh, at Compass Youth Collaborative, we build relationships with 11 to 18 year olds who are at high risk. And by high risk, I'm not labeling the youth at all. Uh, I mean the environments that are often plagued by the poverty, violence, and lack of opportunity that Senator Murphy talked about. And Compass helps youth to navigate these opportunities and build peace in the Hartford community. We do this by hiring community members who have walked the same path as, the, as these youth and had similar li lived experiences. These peace builders, ladies and gentlemen that I often call heroes on the streets of Hartford are there in the times of peace and when there is gun violence. They relentlessly pursue the youth and recruit them on street corners in order to gain their trust and build relationships that will eventually save their lives. Youth are eventually attracted to peace builders because they're walking, the peace builders are walking testimonies of the positivity and peace that is possible in their own lives after having lived chaotic and violent lives themselves. Compass peace builders are those ambassadors of peace and we've actually started using uh, the less clinical version of the cognitive behavioral therapy, we call it TEB or thoughts, emotions and behaviors. Uh, Compass is offering these uh, TEB skills to help youth navigate uh, troubling thoughts and emotions in order for them to make better decisions. We are literally meeting youth on wherever they are in the community, whether it's at home, on the street corner, at one or two in the morning, uh, after a fight, before a fight, once they've gone to a hospital after a shooting or a stabbing, the work is intense and it's a matter of life or death. It requires a coordination of services from agencies who intervene in the lives of these youth who are living in high risk. And Compass is truly proud to be a partner with many agencies, but with the city of Hartford as well, where Mayor Bronin and Thea Montanez have organized community agencies that respond to crisis together within five hours of a violent incident, again, within five days to follow up, uh, and five weeks later to ensure that youth are connected to services that will begin the healing for our youth. Uh, Compass knows that without consistent and reliable supports for youth in trauma, that this can affect future violence. Uh, this consistent trauma really does impact the development of their brains. In fact, it rewires it. There are developmental delays and gaps in knowledge, and it's replaced with that desire to fight or flee, and we have many of those youth in our program. In fact, Senator Murphy met one of the, our youth at a Connecticut Against Gun Violence event uh, a few years ago. And what you may not know, Senator, is that Sean was shot on uh, in his neighborhood in the north end of Hartford as he walked with his five-year-old family member. He mentions that at 13, he lived on a street where a lot of people died and a lot of bad things happen to people is what he says. And he didn't think that he would be a victim of gun violence on that day. He just wanted to enjoy his Memorial Day weekend. 
when he saw a car strolling down his neighborhood and the car sprayed the neighborhood with bullets coming from a 45 caliber gun. Sean was wounded in the leg. Thankfully, the five-year-old was not physically wounded, but I know that his trauma also needed to be addressed. Sean was connected to a peace builder in our program because years later, Sean feared become a becoming a victim again and was ready to protect himself. Sean's trauma and negative associations were leading him to believe that his only chance of survival uh, was to be ready to protect himself. But peace builders helped him navigate this curvy path to healing and better decision making. Uh, we know that these youth will relapse and that peace builders will be there to help them uh, get up and make better decisions. Um, and the changing the mindsets will take years of hard work and I'm confident that we can get there. We all know the saying that actually says, uh, hurt people, hurt people. And at Compass, we add this part of healed people, heal people and loved people, love people. And uh, Compass is playing an active role in reducing the gun violence by being in the community um, day and night. And we need to uh, address policies as well that bring us peace and healing into the neighborhoods. In addition to the background checks um, and extreme protection orders, we've talked about as a community, the, the need to have support for working to uh, support and funding to support uh, gun violence programs that are working to prevent this actively in the community. We also have talked about, you know, since we are all talking about the CDC um, and this being a public health issue, um, we need to actually be able to fund this and um, research it and find local strategies that will benefit um, the communities, specific communities. And then we also need mental health supports for victims and perpetrators of violence. So I know that it goes beyond um, the gun laws. There's a lot of healing work that also needs to take place in order to prevent violence. I thank you for your time and thank you, Yukon. Again, thank you for your remarks, uh, uh, Jackie. Now we're going to turn to the question and answer period. And I'd like to ask all of the panelists to turn on their microphones and, and, and uh, their videos. And um, I'd like to begin the questions. We have a question from State Representative Jillian Gilchrist, who represents Connecticut's 18th District in West Hartford. And she'll pose the first question. And I'd like to ask all of the questioners to direct their questions to a specific uh, panelist. Jillian. Great, thank you so much. My question is for Jackie Santiago, so good to see you. Uh, community gun violence has increased as a result of COVID-19. If the state legislature or the federal government could do one thing to help prevent or reduce gun violence, what would that be? It's nice to see you as well, Jillian. Uh, I continue to say that really the work that needs to be done in communities of color, um, uh, we need to invest in those communities of color. Um, there are 56% of the uh, youth affected by gun violence are African American, and this is um, really what Chris Murphy was talking about earlier in terms of, you know, uh, lots of uh, poverty and, um, and issues of, of violence are closely linked to that. Um, I believe that we need to release state funding levels to support violence interrupters and other agencies working in these hard hit communities uh, and dedicate funding to work on the ground as well as dedicated support to building the system level supports and evaluations that are the backbone for agencies delivering services on the ground. Uh, it would include funding to support hospital violence intervention and other supports uh, aimed at reducing gun violence in the cities. Um, right now we are um, supporting uh, three different bills, HB 60, um, 6033 and HB 6034 to create that state level funding and support for the violence prevention agencies and also HB 5677, which would provide some additional funding to support um, intervention um, work through Medicare. Else on the panel want to um, contribute to that answer? Uh, 
and move on to the next question, who, which is from Ms. Cassandra Devaney, who's a student at UConn School of Law. Uh, Cassandra, please join us by unmuting your mic and turning your video on. Thank you. My question is for Senator Murphy. The main purpose of the Background Check Expansion Act is to prevent dangerous individuals from acquiring guns, thereby preventing gun deaths. Senator Joe Manchin has argued private sales should be exempt, stating that people who know each other should be able to sell guns to one another. How do we distinguish between the outcome we are trying to reach and the nature of the sale, particularly when trying to convince opposing senators to support the legislation? Well, uh, Cassandra, thanks for uh, the question. It's a really important one. Um, I, I think first you have to dispel the mythology of what's involved in a background check. Um, background checks on average take five to 10 minutes. Um, there is really no inconvenience whatsoever involved in most of these background checks. Those that take longer um, often take longer for a reason because the individual has um, a criminal history that requires research um, by uh, those that are doing the search efforts at NICS. Um, I believe it's important for all gun sales to be subject to a background check, and I am joined by 95% of Americans who think the same thing. Um, it's just not too much to ask to make sure that you're not transferring a weapon to somebody who has a criminal history, somebody who has a serious history of mental illness. Um, I'm sympathetic to the argument that, that, that Senator Manchin and, and others are making. Um, but it is not uh, the case that all private sales are between two people who know each other well. Uh, in fact, there are many private sales that are not happening on the internet, that are not happening in gun shows, aren't subject to any advertisement um, between um, two individuals in, in which there is not even a casual acquaintance. The law presently says that you can't sell a weapon to somebody if you know that that weapon is going to be used in the commission of a crime, or if you know that that individual um, is prohibited from buying uh, a gun because of their criminal history. Well, uh, maybe if you're selling to your best friend, you know the answers to those two questions, but there are plenty of sales um, that happen every day, you know, just down the street from me here in Hartford, Connecticut, um, in which there's one individual selling a gun to another individual, um, who doesn't, who can't know that the crime is going to be committed, um, but who has no idea whether that individual is prohibited from buying a gun or not. And the reality is that many people pursue gun purchases in the private market specifically because they would be prohibited from buying a gun if they went to a gun store. They hear about somebody who's got a gun, who's willing to sell it. They know that they would be prohibited from buying a gun if they went to the store, and so they pursue that private sale. So um, the Manchin-Toomey bill, which is the background checks bill from 2013, that would have only covered commercial sales. I believe you've got to cover private sales as well. I don't believe that that's a, a burden that will uh, be a substantial inconvenience to uh, gun owners and again, uh, and gun sellers or gun purchasers. And again, um, I, I, the, my b belief, which is Senator Blumenthal's belief, is also the belief of 90, 95% of Americans. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Um, our third question is from Dr. Caitlin Elsesser. Uh, Caitlin is an assistant professor at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work. And Caitlin, please join us by unmuting your mic and turning your video on. There you are. See. Hi, everyone. So I have a question for Jackie Santiago. Uh, Ms. Santiago, I'm building on Representative Gilchrist's question um, about what kind of policies are needed um, based on your experience working closely with youth and families coping with community violence in Hartford for over 20 years. Uh, what do you think is critical for policymakers to consider in terms of what we need to build safer communities? I think we need funding to support the, the needs of the agencies who are working on the ground tirelessly with these families and youth. Um, in particular, I believe that there are should be more mandatory trauma and uh, mental health support services for perpetrators as well as uh, the victims of violence. Uh, most shooters that we see are repeat offenders um, and uh, never, never get any 
um, treatment for mental health services um, unless they want to go. And I think that that's something that I think it brings a lot of healing into our communities, um, not just the legal consequences for these things. Um, additionally, we hear in our communities that, that guns are brought into our communities um, illegally, purchased by someone legally and, per, and brought in illegally where they're just opening the trunk of the car and um, having sales from the back of a trunk of a car. Um, and we need policies around that to regulate the, the way that kids are getting their hands on guns in the communities. Um, as well as, you know, I, I mentioned before, uh, we always talk about CDC uh, having being uh, claiming this is a public health issue, and it, it is. However, there's not much funding given in order to um, to do the research as it relates to this, and to fund the organizations that are doing this work. Um, we need to conduct um, epidemic um, research on really on the all of the local risk factors for gun violence and gun crimes. Um, and involvement of, of how this actually happens and use the findings to improve the city gun violence prevention strategies that we have. Um, and I do think that there needs to be um, funding to support the cities who are dealing with an overwhelming um, amount of violence in their communities. I commend um, Mayor Bronin and his team for um, convening groups of providers that are actually working with um, during crisis times in order to make sure that these youth are connected to services long-term. So I would say those are the things that um, most impact our community. Thank you. If I may, sure. I was just gonna say, I sure. completely agree with the points that Ms. Santiago was making. Um, and I would just add, we're not gonna solve gun violence with one solution. Uh, this is a multifaceted problem that's gonna require uh, multiple interventions. Yes, we need to think about policy as a way to address some of the supply side issues related to gun violence, but we also need to make substantial investments in communities that are experiencing the greatest impacts of gun violence, and we need to start treating public health problems with public health interventions rather than resulting, uh, you know, defaulting to policing strategies uh, in our communities of color. We really need to focus on these investments so that we can start healing. Thank you both. Uh, if I can just make a point, Alan. Sure. Um, you know, uh, other countries have mental health problems. Other countries have poverty. Other countries have social unrest and educational problems but none have the rates of gun violence that our country does. So I think we need to deal with those fundamental problems, but we need to recognize also that we just have more guns and more gun violence and steps, discrete steps can be taken to surmount it. And to go back to Cassandra's excellent question before, you know, um, I think people often forget that these purchases by felons, by drug addicts, or people with substance use disorder, others are against the law right now. They're against the law. Background checks are simply an enforcement mechanism. And the, the fact that these laws are so widely supported by the American people, it simply attests to the fact that they are an enforcement mechanism. If you want to hear people who are really passionate about emergency risk orders and background checks, talk to law enforcement people because they're the ones who have to stare down these crime guns that are brought to Connecticut by the iron pipeline, as it's sometimes called, from states that have weak gun laws where people can load the back of their cars or the trunks of their cars with guns and then sell them in downtown Hartford or elsewhere. So this is a law enforcement issue. And uh, I very much agree with the statements that have been made about 
needing to attack poverty, needing to deal with those other fundamental social problems. These issues of public policy are deeply and urgently important, but we need to recognize we have no excuse for the amount of gun violence in the United States. Yeah. Let me just put in my own two cents here. I noticed um, on the supply of guns issue in this country that noticed a st statistic this week that we have more than twice as many guns per capita as the next country on the list. And the next country on the list is Yemen. So we have some, uh, we have some work to do to reduce that supply too. Um, anyway, thanks everyone. And, and our next, I'll turn to our next questioner, who's John Monet. John is a Yukon Master of Public Administration student. Uh, John, please unmute your microphone and turn on your video and feel free to ask your question. Thank you very much. And it is really a pleasure to be speaking and listening to all these eminent uh, professionals. So my question goes to Dr. Cassie. Um, it seems like there's strong, very strong public support for some gun control measures, such as universal background checks. But groups like the NRA say that many people don't want many forms of gun control. Do lobbying groups like the NRA result in policy that is counter to what the American public wants? And if so, what can be done to combat this? Thank you, John, that's a great question. So first, let me say, um, in our most recent wave of our public opinion polling, we asked about 22 specific policies designed to reduce gun injury and death. 18 out of 22 of those policies had majority support among gun owners. And we need to engage gun owners in these solutions. So I think there's a false narrative that drives the idea that no one agrees and therefore we can't get anything done. But importantly, there are two components of support. So there's breadth and there's depth. How many people support something and how willing are they to actually do something um, to evidence that support. For a very long time, the gun lobby uh, took advantage of the depth of the support of members of their organizations uh, to contact legislators, show up to rallies or you know uh, hearings and vote. And uh, the same wasn't always true for folks who were promoting gun safety legislation. Uh, and uh, there's this is what we um, think of as a, a motivation gap. So there may be very broad support for something, but how, how active are people to actually um, engage? Uh, but there have been a lot of shifts in this motivation gap and, and an erosion of the motivation gap really, I think, since December 2012. The formation of groups like Mom Demand Action, Students Demand Action, March for Our Lives, and so many others um, have addressed this gap. Groups have taken a page um, out of uh, the successes of Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, showing up, being present, demanding action, holding people accountable uh, when they failed to engage in the actions that were supported by so many constituents. Previously, uh, if you got an F rating from the NRA, that could have uh, totally annihilated someone's chance um, in a campaign. But now we see candidates who proudly tout that F rating who are being endorsed as gun sense candidates. And this is really changing the way people are thinking about what's possible uh, to prevent gun violence. Unfortunately, so far, this hasn't led to a lot of action in terms of laws being passed at the federal level, but there's been tremendous action at the state level. One concrete example that's been talked about a few times are extreme risk protection order laws. These laws that temporarily separate someone from their firearms during a time of crisis. In 2016, two, maybe three states had these policies. Currently, 19 states have them with many more under consideration, and there's been legislation uh, discussed at the federal level. So change is possible. Making sure that constituents are reaching out to their elected officials, you know, letting them know what their perspectives are on policy and holding them accountable for their actions is really key uh, to ensuring that the policies we have in place match 
the broad public support that they experience. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add to that uh, to that answer? Um, if not, um, our last question from the audience is from Kyle Brennan Marquez, Associate Professor of Law and William T. Golden Scholar at the Yukon School of Law. Professor Marquez, are you on? Yes. Go, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks everyone for such a terrific panel. My question is for um, Senator Blumenthal. It's about the Second Amendment. Uh, so, you know, in 2008, the Supreme Court clarified that the right to bear arms is best understood as an individual right. In other words, you know, efforts to sort of constrain the way that individuals lawfully use and acquire weapons uh, comes under constitutional scrutiny. So I'm just wondering how lawmakers in Washington, especially members of the subcommittee, um, you know, which your chair, uh, think about these Second Amendment questions and sort of what routes forward um, can be harmonized with the Supreme Court's current understanding of the law. Thank you very much, Professor. Excellent question. Um, and uh, needless to say, Senator Murphy and I have thought a lot about these constitutional issues because we respect the Constitution and the Second Amendment. Uh, but nothing we have proposed in any way implicates any conflict with the Second Amendment as the Supreme Court has articulated it in the Heller opinion written by Justice Scalia, as you know. In that opinion, not only did the court say that it was an individual right, but it specifically said it was not unlimited. There are limits on every constitutional right because often, as you well know from having taught and read and uh, been a scholar in this area, rights conflict with one another. And so the Second Amendment is not unlimited and every one of these proposals, and I'll, I'll just give you an example, is consistent with the Second Amendment. The Emergency Risk Protection Order contemplate that a police officer will go to someone's home and take away a firearm. Now, that alone might well be interpreted as a violation of due process. You're taking somebody's property. That's why in the emergency risk protection orders in Connecticut and elsewhere, that police officer has to first go to court or a family member and say to the court, this person is dangerous and set forth specific facts that justify a, an order or a warrant from the court to the police officer. Those specific facts have to delineate what the danger is, the factual basis for that conclusion. For example, that person said, as in Parkland, I'm gonna kill people. Or as in countless examples around the country, I'm gonna kill myself. These emergency orders are tremendously effective in protecting people, either the person himself or herself or others. And then they contemplate a further aspect of due process that within a discrete period of time, 10 days, two weeks, a week, depending on the state law, that person who is separated from the firearm can go back to court and contest the facts that were presented. Now, often those initial orders are granted ex parte, that is without the person being there because the circumstances are often exigent, but there is a right within a period of time for that individual, the gun owner, to go to court and say to the judge, it isn't true what was said about me. And here are the facts. Every one of these emergency risk protection procedures provides for that right. So there's a right to due process, but emergency risk protection orders save lives. How do we know? All you have to do is listen to law enforcement, to judges who issue them. Uh, recently, we had a judge nominee come before the Senate Judiciary Committee. He was nominated to fill a position on the federal bench. 
He had issued countless of these orders. I said to him, do they save lives? He said, I've issued hundreds. They save lives. And so uh, I think we need to recognize there's a constitutional right under the Second Amendment. We respect it. It's an individual right, but it's not unlimited. And you can go through every one of our proposals, every one of these laws, which are, which are matters of Connecticut law. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that I litigated the assault weapon ban in Connecticut. Literally, I tried the case in Litchfield County and then argued it in the Supreme Court of our state. The arguments haven't changed. They're the same arguments. And every one of these laws has been upheld over the years. So it's an excellent question, but make no mistake, we don't need to repeal the Second Amendment. I know there's some people who want to repeal it, but what we're saying here is you can legislate without in any way conflicting this with the Second Amendment or taking away people's constitutional rights. Alan, if, uh, if, if I might just jump in, I think Dick had it completely right. Um, I do think we should acknowledge, though, that there is a really dangerous strain of jurisprudence uh, emerging um, that would argue for the dramatic constriction of legislature's ability uh, to effectuate the Scalia doctrine. Um, Scalia says there's uh, a, a right to private gun ownership in the Second Amendment. Um, you can disagree or agree with that finding. But then he further says, as, as Dick mentioned, you, you, that's a right that's uh, subject to regulation, the type of people who can own weapons and the type of weapons you can own. Um, one of the things that Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett have suggested in some of their writings is that um, one, courts should make a determination, not legislatures, as to uh, who is dangerous and who is not, um, and what kind of weapons are too dangerous and which ones aren't. Um, Amy Coney Barrett wrote a pretty famous opinion in which she made this argument um, to essentially take that factual determination away from the legislature. That would be a stunning um, change in the, the, the in the precedent. Second, Kavanaugh has expressed support for um, an idea in which once a weapon becomes um, uh, sort of spread out in commerce, it is constitutionally protected, which is a ridiculous notion because that would mean that if a right-wing Congress for a one-year period of time legalized Stinger missiles and thousands of people bought Stinger missiles, then they would enjoy permanent constitutional protection. Um, so there are these, I, I think, real dangers ahead of us, um, which is why we have to be careful to um, appoint judges who are going to interpret the Second Amendment as it was intended. I, I think that our founding fathers probably believed in a common law right of gun ownership, but I also know that there was tons of gun regulation um, uh, all over America at the time of our founding. Uh, that's the real Second Amendment, and, um, uh, the one I think that uh, Justice Scalia himself um, acknowledged in his, in, in his opinion. Chris makes a very good point. Uh, there are a lot of different strains of, forgive me, uh, far-right extreme views of various amendments that have been spread by some of the recent appointees to the lower courts as well as the Supreme Court. It's one of the reasons why both Senator Murphy and, and I opposed those nominations of Supreme Court justices and why I opposed almost all of the Trump nominees to the lower courts as well. But those uh, opinions so far are dissenting or concurring opinions. They're not opinions of the courts. And I am hopeful that they will die the, the death that they so richly deserve uh, jurisprudentially, and they'll be seen as outliers in this jurisprudence. Well, thank you. That's, a, that's an important question. And I want to just end this segment with a question of my own, which I will keep very brief. Uh, and I want to address it to both, uh, both senators. 
Um, Senator Blumenthal, you mentioned at the beginning in your remarks, PLACA. And uh, for those of you who don't know what PLACA is, it's a uh, statute Congress passed about 15 years ago that largely exempts the gun industry and only the gun industry from liability suits uh, regarding and foreseeable misuse of their products. And it, it can be seen as permitting the industry and its retailers to flood the market with guns without accountability. Um, is there any appetite in Congress to address this? I think this issue gets less attention than some of the others, but it's a really important issue. Is there an appetite to address it, do you think? I wouldn't say there is an immediate likelihood of passage, but I think eventually it will be repealed. When I say passage, I mean passage of the bill that I introduced, which is called Equal Access to Justice for Victims of Gun Violence Act. I'm not sure what the acronym would be for that, but essentially it would repeal PLACA. This is a particularly important issue for Senator Murphy and myself because the lead litigation brought by the victims of Sandy Hook is in court right now and was almost barred by PLACA, may, may still be barred by PLACA. This immunity, just think of it for a moment, is enjoyed by almost no other industry. If any manufacturer, let's say you buy a toaster or you buy a car and it's defective, and you suffer an injury, you can bring a lawsuit based on a violation of the standard of reasonable care. Uh, as a litigator, I used to do this fairly commonly. And it's a way of keeping the manufacturers honest, so to speak, because they know there will be a penalty to pay if they make a defective product. It's pretty simple. And there's a way for victims to seek compensation for the harm done to them. None of it applies to the gun manufacturers. And the victims of Sandy Hook have very courageously brought a lawsuit. It has survived the challenges based on PLACA so far, but many, many other lawsuits have been thrown out of court because of this broad immunity enjoyed uniquely by the gun manufacturers. And so, uh, Representative Schiff, Adam Schiff in the House, uh, we in the Senate, Senator Murphy and I have sponsored legislation that would repeal PLACA. Uh, he may have, uh, Senator Murphy may feel differently than I do. I don't think it's at the very top of the list of gun violence prevention measures likely to be adopted, but it is certainly well merited. And uh, it's basically a sweetheart deal that 15 years ago, as you, as you say, Alan, was adopted without really extensive consideration. And it was adopted at the height of the gun lobby's powers. For all the reasons that we've articulated, the gun lobby has lost that grip on Congress. It's lost a lot of its power. And I am hopeful that at some point, may not be the, this session, probably not, but at some point, PLACA will be repealed. Thank you, uh, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Murphy, we have, we're have a little tight on time, but do you have anything you'd like to add to that? No, uh, I'm tight on time as well. This has been really fantastic. So I think uh, Dick covered it well. Okay, well, well, thank you and thank all of our panelists. And now I'd like to ask everyone to head backstage by turning off their cameras and muting their mics. And I'd like to invite uh, Provost Carl Leshway to join us for the closing remarks. Thank you, Alan. And so I would just like to align my remarks around five words, facts, leadership, urgency, traumatic growth, and courage. Let's start with facts. Dr. Krafasi talked about the facts that people want extens extensions of background checks. They want requiring licenses. They want stronger ERPO in effect. There's the facts that these things work. Extended background checks work. Requiring licenses work. ERPO works. In terms of leadership, Senator Murphy talked about Connecticut as being a leader, a lab for experimentation, and, and you can then extend that out as a lab for outcomes. 
Senator Blumenthal talked about urgency. We have a political dynamic now and a weak gun lobby and an opportunity with urgency to make change. Ms. Santiago talked about traumatic growth and what it means to support victims and communities by focusing on lived experience of those providing services, meeting victims where they are in their communities and, and where they are in their periods of healing and consistent and reliable support. Finally, courage. And courage ties into all of these. It takes courage to stand behind facts when you're fighting against false narratives and, and quite frankly, a, an absence of facts. It takes courage to be the first out of the gate and, and the model by which you're trying to move others. It takes courage to seize an opportunity in a moment where there is that urgency. And, and for me, I'm, you know, my degree is in clinical psychology. I understand the courage it takes to work with victims in, in a place where, where they are deeply hurting and they need so much more and authenticity in, in how we work with them. And it's only with these things that we've heard here today from these really terrific speakers and their answers to questions in which we can be part of our path forward and, and be that necessity for the real change and healing needed. So thank you and I'll turn it over to Kerry to finish up our event. Thank you so much, uh, Provost Leshway. I just wanna echo uh, the thanks from Mr. Bennett and from our provost to our panelists and our participants. Uh, and Provost Leshway, I love those five words. Um, they're, they're terrific, thank you. This has been a remarkable panel and I am so grateful uh, to everyone who made this possible. I know I have, um, I have found this conversation both thought provoking and energizing. We have so much work to do, but it seems easier when we all work together and that courage also seems easier to muster. Uh, as a reminder, the virtual reception, which has been made possible by the Connecticut chapter of the Scholar Strategy Network will begin shortly. Um, I just have to go start the Zoom for that. Uh, that event does require a separate login, uh, which you should have received in your RSVP or via um, a different email. So I hope to see you in the Zoom room for conversation. And if not there, then online or in person sometime soon. On behalf of the GVP rig and UConn, thank you again for joining us.